Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it this night, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for bringing revelation. Thank you that we'll be doers of it and we'll see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of conquering in all areas of your life. We've talked about many things. We've talked about conquering sin, conquering unrighteousness, conquering, conquering lawlessness, conquering the world, conquering, conquering the flesh, conquering all disobedience, and conquering self as well. And we've been most recently talking about conquering through the restoration of our soul. And today we talked about in the morning service about areas of problems that we need to conquer in our life specifically in the soulish realm if we are going to see God accomplish what he purposes for us in our life. We're going to continue on that tonight. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. When you get born again, you get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Your soul has not been changed and your body has not been changed. Your body is the body of death that has sin dwelling in it, dwelling in the flesh which will drive you, if you give place to it, to continually walk in sin. Your soul is made up of your will, your intellect, and your emotions. And that is where the battleground is. Your soul is to yield to the spirit, so you will walk in the spirit. If your soul yields to the body, or yields to the sin, or yields to the devil, or anything that's contrary to the word, then you will walk in sin. It is important that we come to the place where our soul is submitted to the way of the Spirit by doing what the Word says. The very God of peace will sanctify you, make you holy. This is God's desire for everyone. It's the optative mood in the Greek, which is a mood expressing His desire, what His will is for us. It is conditional upon us doing what He says to accomplish it, not automatic. And when he talks about sanctifying you wholly, this means to bring you to perfection and complete in all respects. You and I are going on to perfection, and we are becoming that perfected, glorious, end-time church as we walk in his ways. And as we see this work accomplished, the whole spirit, soul, and body is to be preserved blameless. Your spirit's right, but the soul's to be now preserved blameless unto or at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also talked about 3 John, a very important scripture to understand. <coughs> Verse 2. Beloved, I wish, the word wish is a Greek word, eukamai, which means to pray. I pray concerning, not above. In this case, it would mean concerning. It means above in some cases, but this is, means concerning all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. And we pointed out that the word prosper refers to you having a good journey, being successful in everything that you do. Now this is something that God will accomplish in your life. This is a passive voice. The passive voice in the Greek means the subject, which is you and me, is being acted upon by somebody else. Not that we are going to do it. God's going to do it in us. And that is when we meet the conditions that are necessary to see that happen. And this is to happen ongoing, by the way, because of the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. It's to continually happen. And we're also to be in health. He wants you to be in health continually, as we see again, the present tense, ongoing. Now, then it comes to the place of even as, which means in proportion as, or in the degree of, your soul prospering. That is an important statement. That means as the soul goes, so will your overall prosperity and health be. If your soul's not doing well, you're not going to prosper, and you're not going to be in health. Because your soul, where you think and reason, and where you choose, and you allow yourself to be either yielded to the Spirit or walk contrary to the Word of God, that determines the choices and the direction that you are taking. And when it talks about your soul prospering again, this is 
Again, a passive voice, meaning God is the one who's going to cause this to happen. But you have to do what the Word says so that He accomplishes it. He will do it even as your soul is being prospered by the Lord continually because you are hearing and doing His Word. That was what puts Him in operation. So again, as the soul goes, so goes your health and your prosperity in life. So therefore, we have to get our soul restored, healed, and set free. Of the scriptures we've looked at that we want to look up again tonight, Psalms 23, verse 3, He restoreth my soul. God is at work to restore your soul, to bring it back to where it should be, which is to get it healed, get it delivered, become strong, become full of the things of the Word of God, so that you will choose the way of the Lord, and you will be thinking as He wants you to think. We also saw a scripture in Psalms 41, verse 4. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Why does our soul need to get healed? Because of sin. Every one of us have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, we have problems. And we need to see our whole soul get healed and made free from all the bondages that come in from open door of sin. Therefore, there is a necessity of a healing and a restoration of your soul from all areas of sin in your life. We look at Proverbs 23. Another thing that's important regarding your soul, verse 7. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith thee, but his heart is not with thee. The word heart is a mistake in the King James. When you look at this word and you find out what it means, it's the word nefesh in the Hebrew, which means soul. You can tell that it's wrongly translated because the word heart is also used here in another place, and it's correctly translated. It's the word lab, which is the word for heart, translated throughout the, most all, throughout the Old Testament in the King James Version. So this is talking about as he thinketh in his soul, so is he. That means your mind needs to get renewed to the Word so that you will think, and when you think correctly, then you'll choose correctly, and you will choose the way of the Spirit, which is the way of the Word of God. Another scripture we've looked at that's important, if you're going to see the restoration of your soul and see God accomplish what He purposes in your life, Luke 9, verse 23 and 24. He said to them all, If any man will to come, wills to come. The reason I say that is because this is the main verb in that clause, present tense, meaning if you are continually willing. The word come is an infinitive in the Greek. Will is not a helper verb for come. Instead, the word come is an infinitive. Here we show you. An infinitive is translated to something, just like it is in English. That's why Young's literal, which is what we have down here, the YLT, Young's literal, the best New Testament translation that I know of, wills to come, shows accurately what's being said. So if any man is willing continually to come after me, that means you set your will to come after him. But then there's things you must do. Just because you're willing to come after him doesn't mean that it's going to be successful unless you meet the conditions. And what's the first thing? Deny himself. You must deny yourself. You deny yourself because you're not going to walk in your own ways. And you take up your cross daily, which is the crucifying of the flesh. You're going to put to death the deeds of the body. And you're going to follow him by putting the word of God first place and doing what he says. Regarding the soul, you cannot let your soul direct your life. You must be directed by the Word. This says, Whosoever will save or preserve his suke. This is the word for life that means soul. Suke is the word for soul. It can mean life in certain cases, but in this case, it refers to the soul life. Whoever will save or preserve his soul life shall destroy it. What that means is if you're going to run your soul, your life from your soul, 
you're going to destroy it because the soul has to be submitted to the spirit in order to walk in the ways of the word of God. You can't be doing what you want to do. You're to deny yourself, remember. But whosoever will destroy, this is what the word means, apollomy, destroy his soul-directed life, what this is referring to, for my sake, the same shall save it. Because how are we going to walk? We're going to walk after the Spirit in line with the Word of God, and that is absolutely essential. Now, we talked about many things this morning of specific ways that your soul gets damaged. And we went through many different things. We're not going to go through them again, but we will bring out one scripture that we've pointed out. In Proverbs chapter 8, we see in verse 35, Whoso findeth me findeth life, and obtains favor of the Lord. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. When you sin, it's damaging your soul. It is having an effect upon you. And you're not to see your soul get damaged. Your soul is supposed to be strengthened. Your soul is supposed to be restored. It's to be healed. It's to become a fat soul with the things of God. All they that hate me love death. And what's that talking about? Well, what's the wages of sin? Death. If you obey God, then you're going to see blessings. But those who don't obey, it's as if they hate him because they love death because that's what sin's going to produce. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, we've got to deal with all sin, and we've talked about that extensively in the past. We conquer sin, and we won't wrong our soul. But if you continue to walk in sin, you're going to wrong your soul continually, and you will be all kinds of problems that will occur. But we're going to pick up with other points tonight, talking about how your soul has areas where they need to be restored because of damage that it comes. In Psalms verse, chapter 6, verse 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. Now, this is because of sin, also because of the attacks of the enemy, things that have come in, destructive things. He says, But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me from thy mercy's sake. Our soul needs to get delivered. It needs to get healed. It needs to get restored because of what has happened from the area of sin. And notice, when your soul's been messed up, it even affects your bones. You'll see that in other scriptures we'll be bringing out. Your, soul, but your bones get vexed. Otherwise, a lot of physical problems are tied into phys to soul realm problems. That's why we need to make sure that our soul is getting restored. The soul is sore vexed. Well, God doesn't want that. He wants you to get healed. He wants you to get delivered. He wants you to get set free from the bondage. How long it takes? As long as it takes for you to bring things in line with the Word of God and get delivered and healed. John 14, verse 27 tells us something. Peace I leave with you. He wants to give you peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Through the soul realm, you will yield yourself to things that will allow things to come into your heart. We cannot let ourselves be all troubled, agitated. Let it be afraid. You're to guard yourself. You're to have your mind stayed on the things of the Lord, and you'll stay in peace. We see over in Isaiah chapter 26, in verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Well, You've got to keep your mind on him. How do you keep your mind on him? On the word. Because he trusteth in thee. In fact, you prove you trust in him by your mind being stayed upon or leaned upon the word. If you deviate from the word, you get your mind on other things, then we're not trusting in him now. We're looking at something else. And he'll keep you in perfect peace. That means if we're not in peace, that means the enemy must have got to our soul in some way. We don't want to let anything take away our peace. God is a God of peace, and he wants you to be abiding in peace at all times in your life. We see over in Psalms 13, Verse 2, 
How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Well, this guy's been taking counsel in his soul from something that came into his heart. Sorrow gets into you, sadness, all kinds of negative things, grief, anguish, it can mean. That's in you. If you take counsel from that daily, the enemy will continue to work and to bring that into your soul. And what's going on? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? That's the enemy working. He doesn't want you to be full of sorrow, sadness, down, depressed, grief, anguish. That's a work of the enemy. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. He does not want you to have these kinds of things. Now you take counsel on your soul from this sorrow if you think on it and you reflect upon it and you keep on allowing it to uh, dominate your mind. That's why we need to take our thoughts captive. It's important that you govern your thought life by taking your thoughts captive and thinking on good things and not allowing yourself to take any counsel in the soulless realm from those things that are within you, that are destructive. No, you're gonna to wanna to get that set free. You're gonna get delivered, cast that out and get the word of God in your heart, not sorrow in your heart. You wanna get what the word says in your heart and so you walk in the ways of the Lord. Now, if you have this sorrow and this grief and this anguish, it's gonna take a toll upon you in your life. Psalm 6, verse 7. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. And this is talking about anger, vexation, frustration. It waxes old because of all my enemies. That tells you something. The enemies will try to get a hold of you. And who's the enemies? The evil spirits working, and they want to get you into anger, they want to get you into frustration, they want to get you into grief, any kind of thing that's negative going on within you. It'll affect you physically. Your eye will be consumed. It'll wax old because of the enemies that come in. See, you're opening up the door for the enemy. We must guard ourselves and not let the enemy have place in our life. Psalms 31, verse 9. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I'm in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Same thing, anger, frustration, all these evil things. Yea, my soul and my belly. It'll not only take hold in your soul, it'll take hold in your belly, which can mean your belly or your womb or anywhere in your body. It'll have quite an effect upon you. Hey, the demons will come in and they'll work in all kinds of ways. That's why we cannot let ourselves to be distressed or in trouble by having grief, anger, frustration. Those things need to be conquered in your life. You need to take your thoughts captive and think on good things and not let yourself react to the things that come at you in life. He said, for my life is spent with grief. That's what's been happening. He's been going this way he's been continually. And my years was sighing. Oh, he's sighing and groaning over all these negative things. And notice what else he says, my strength. This is the word koak, which means a manifest power or strength. Fails because of mine iniquity. And my bones are consumed. They're wasting away, that means. <laughs> There's a cause for problems. There's a reason for it. Things just don't happen. No. Here, his life was spent with grief. He's continually groaning and sighing over things that have happened. Because of his iniquity, he doesn't have any power or strength in operation and his bones are getting wasting away because of his sin. This shows you this is all happening because of what's going on in the soulish realm. Grief, sorrow, anguish, all these kind of things. We need to make sure we're governing what we're choosing, what we're thinking, what we're going on, going on in our life inside us. We have to make sure we're not reacting to the emotions and the negative feelings that come. We need to govern them with the Word of God. We see another scripture over in Job that speaks of problems as well that come. Chapter 17, verse 7. 17, verse 7. Mine eye also is dim by reason of sorrow, and all my members are as a shadow. <laughs> that means it affects your eyes. It'll be dim by reason of sorrow. 
negative things. There's always a cause for all these things. God doesn't cause these things. It's sin of some sort that causes these problems to come forth in our life. We need to make sure that we get ourselves filled up with the Word of God and walking in the way of the Lord and not giving place to anything that would take us into sin or in the ways of the world or in the ways of the flesh. This brings us to another point. You need to get spiritually fed and have a fat soul. In Psalms 107, verse 5, Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Why would they be hungry and thirsty? Because they don't have the Word in them. If you have the Word of God in you, then you'll be filled. You're to be filled up with the Word of God. If, so what happens? If you don't have the Word in you, are you going to be able to think correctly? Are you going to be able to choose correctly? Are you going to have the strength within to deal with attacks that come against you? No. It says their soul fainted within them. We can't allow ourselves to not be fed with the Word of God. We also need to make sure that we're, we're doing what he wants us to do in all situations. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about in verse 2 how we're to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The word looking is an interesting word in the Greek. It means to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something. What are we going to do? We're going to fix them on the Lord. We're going to fix it on the Word of God. So we're going to look at him in the word of God, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Whatever's come, you just endure it, you, just, you despise the things, but you just could go forth and walk in victory, overcome it. Consider him that endured such contradiction as sinners against himself. Any kind of attacks that come against you, don't react to them negatively. Don't get all bent out of shape and upset. No, we need to respond in the spirit and not be responding out of the flesh or out of a soulish, carnal attitude. Notice, lest you get wearied and faint in your, not minds, this is the word suke, which means soul. Young's corrects the error. You can get wearied and faint in your soul if you let things that people do to you get to you. You've got to learn to live above being moved by what people do. You can live above hurt. You can live above all these things when people speak things. You know, and no weapon formed against you will prosper. You condemn every tongue that rises against you in judgment. You speak the word of God against any things that are contrary to the word of God, that are lies. And you get your mind tuned, on, tuned in on what the word says and think on the truth. Take your thoughts captive and don't believe negative things that people bring against you. In fact, you need to be ready to resist and strive against any re reactions of sin. You've not resisted under the blood, striving, struggling, fighting against sin. See, sin, remember, will damage your soul. We need to make sure that our soul is always doing the things of the Word of God. Look what it says in Luke 18.1. He spake a parable unto him this end, that men ought, or it is necessary, and this is translated must the majority of times in the New, King, in the, uh, New Testament, must always pray and not to faint. Why would we ever stop praying if we've given place to the enemy in our soul somewhere, in our mind or our will? Because prayer, you pray the word of God, you put him in operation, you release him to accomplish things. If you stop praying, you fainted. If you got to the place ever where you just kind of quit praying because of all the things coming at you, then that's evidence that you obviously have fainted in the midst of the battle. No, we're going to pray and we're not going to faint. Look at this case of one who had fainted, but he got himself tuned in to what he should do, so he got out of the situation. Jonah. Jonah, he's thrown over board. He's now in the fish's belly, and it looks like it's all over for him. Verse 7 of chapter 2. When my soul fainted within me. <laughs> it's like it's all over. Well, he remembered the Lord. See, when the soul tries to go down, get depressed, get discouraged, throw in the towel, give up, it's no way, it's not, nothing's going to work for me, on and on. 
Get your eyes on the Lord. He is the one who will bring you out of it. I remember the Lord, and my prayer came into the, he began to pray. Instead of sitting in that fainting state, he began to pray. His prayer came into thee in thy holy temple. They that observe or pay attention to lying vanities, worthless situations that you're in. If he paid attention to the state he was in, it was over for him. But if he looked to the Lord, ah, there's a way out of here. It says if you observe the lying vanities, the state that you're in, that's not going to bring victory, you're going to forsake, give up your own mercy. See, mercy is available. The mercies of God are new every morning. So, he did the right thing. He began to sacrifice unto God with a voice of thanksgiving, beginning to thank him for delivering him. I will pay that I vowed. He repented because he had run from doing what God wanted to do to go preach the gospel, you know, preach and declare to Nineveh what was going to happen to them and pronounce the judgment. And he also declared, who's the one who's going to bring him out of it? Salvations of the Lord, his deliverance. And what happened? The Lord spake unto the fish and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. If God can bring Jonah out of a fish, he can bring you out of anything and everything. The mercy of God is available for you. Don't ever throw in the towel. Don't ever let yourself get in the place where you're observing lying vanities, the situation you're in, and let go of the mercy of God. Don't ever let your soul be in a faint state. No, you get your eyes on the Lord, begin to pray. Begin to speak the word. Begin to do the things that God wants because he will bring you out of these bondages. God wants us to come get victory, and we can get victory in every situation. This brings us to another thing. You've got to guard your soul that you don't get all down and you lose your joy. No. You know, if you lose your joy, you're in trouble. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verse 15 and following, talks about all the curses that come from disobedience. Verse 15 says, It will come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command this day, all these curses will come on thee and overtake you. And among the curses, just many things, we come down to verse 47. And he says, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things which are available for us, because all the promises are ours, they had covenant promises, what's going to happen? Therefore, you're going to serve your enemies. <laughs> the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and thirst, nakedness and want of all things, put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until I've destroyed thee. Otherwise, judgments are going to come upon you because you are not serving him with gladness of heart and joyfulness. God wants you to guard your heart. The Bible says we're to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He wants you to be rejoicing. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Rejoice in the Lord always. Remember, the Philippian letter was written, these guys were in jail. <laughs> Looked like it was all over. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. He wants you to rejoice at all times. 1 Thessalonians 5, down here in verse 16, he says, rejoice evermore. Well, that's continually. He wants you to have joy. In fact, if you don't have the joy, you're not going to be protected from the attacks of the enemy. This is evident when we look at what is really being said in Nehemiah 8.10, a familiar verse about the joy of the Lord being your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The word strength is a Hebrew word, ma'uz. Ma'uz means a place of safety, protection, refuge. It's a fortified place of protection because you have the joy of the Lord. Well, the joy of the Lord is going to come because of you having the Word in you. If you don't have the Word in you, then you must be thinking on other things. You must be allowing other things to dominate your, your mind and, and the choices that you're making. 
That's why you got to get the word in you. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found. Well, that meant you were in the word and seeking after the word. And I did eat them. If you eat them, that means you took them within you. Yeah, they, you receive this word, become a part of you. And the word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. The word of God will produce joy in you. If you don't have the joy in your heart, in your soul, then there is a problem. We are not letting we, the word be what it's supposed to be. See, many people, they might have heard the word, but then they think on all these other things, negatives. And they wonder why they don't have joy. They think on negative things that are going to affect them in their life. You need to have joy and have your heart protected because look what it says about people that have a merry heart. Proverbs 15, verse 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. That's right. He wants to have, you have a merry heart. If you don't have a merry heart, that means you must have something else, a neg negative things in your heart. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. You can't let sorrow get into you. And of course, it's going to come into your heart from what? From the soulish realm. The soul is a gate into it from your will, your intellect, your emotions, into your heart. So we need to have a merry heart before the Lord at all times. We see down in chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It's like a medicine. It's going to minister health and life to you. But a broken spirit drieth the bones. Yeah, that's because of the fact that we've let negative things come into us. God wants you to guard your heart and make sure that you're not giving place to that which will bring destruction. Because, look at it says, it dries the bones. Well, that means there's problems physically coming into your life. And this isn't the only thing that can cause you to have all these kind of physical problems from the soulish realm. Look at Psalms 32, verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. <laughs> uh, he's roaring. He must be getting upset and getting angry, getting frustrated and all the day long. He didn't want you to do that. We need to be not letting that happen in our soul. It's going to affect you. It affects you in your physical body. You got to watch that you don't have negative attitudes in any aspect. Here it speaks about what envy will do to you. Proverbs 14, verse 30, a sound heart's the life of the flesh, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. <laughs> There's a cause for why things deteriorate. They just don't happen. This is sin that is going to cause these kinds of problems. In fact, look at this scripture. This is why we've got to deal with all sin in our life and get our soul cleaned up, walking in the ways of the Word of God. Job 20, verse 11. His bones are full of what? The sin of his youth. <laughs> that means all the sin you've ever committed, it's affected you. Of course, what's the good news? We can con not only confess our sins, receive forgiveness and cleansing, but that doesn't get rid of the effects of them. What's the good news? We have authority over the devils and we can cast them out because that's what came in from the sin to get set free from the effects of our sin. That's why you just don't cast out the demons that have come in from what's gone on in my life in the recent times. You cast out the demons that have come in from your entire life. What came in from the sin of your youth? You uh, get after that and start casting those spirits out. And you say, well, boy, I really had a bad youth. <laughs> I did a lot of sin. Well, then you've got a lot to cast out, and you need to be addressing those spirits and driving them out of every area of what's happened. Because your bones are full, as he says here, of the sin of his youth. We have been affected by these things. We go over to Psalms 31, verse 10. For my life spent with grief, ears with signs, strength fails, we saw this before, and my bones are consumed. This means they're wasting away. Again, there's a cause for all of these problems. God wants us to make sure that we are not giving place to anything that will bring destruction against us. Another thing that's important 
is that we must receive God's correction, instruction, and discipline in our life. This is a major problem, it seems, for many Christians for some reason. They, if they're humble and submissive, they should be ready to receive correction. We see Proverbs 15, verse 32. He that refuseth instruction, which is discipline, chastening, and correction, the word means in the Hebrew. He despises his own soul because the correction is coming to get your soul in line so you don't keep making the same mistakes and walking in the same areas of sin, making the wrong choices, thinking incorrectly. Letting your emotions dominate you, reacting negatively to situations instead of dealing with them in the spirit. But he that hears the reproof, the rebuke and the correction, he gets understanding so then he can correct his problem, he can walk in line with the word, and he won't give place to it anymore. Don't be one who refuses discipline, chastening, and correction. In reality, you're despising your own soul because you're not, you're going to continue to walk in those negative ways in your life. We must receive the, the correction of the Lord. Let's look at some other scriptures along this line. Job chapter 5, verse 17. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not the chastening of the Almighty. It's going to bring the blessings of God upon you when you make the correction, see, but if you always are resistant, then if you despise the chasing of the Almighty, you're going to be continuing in the ways of sin and see all kinds of destruction coming time after time. Job 36, verse 10. He opened all of their ear to discipline, the word discipline, chastening, correction, and commands that they return from iniquity. God comes to correct you to get you out of walking in sin. Stop walking in that sin. Stop going in that way of iniquity. Correct those problems in your life. Your soul will never get restored and become strong if we don't receive the correction. We've got to get the correction in our life. We should rejoice at correction. Pride doesn't like to be corrected, see? <laughs> no, we cannot have pride. Proverbs 3, verse 11. My son... Despise not the chase in the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. No, we should have the attitude, I want God to correct me in any and all areas that need to be corrected. Oh, we see so many people out there, especially ministers, it seems, they're not correctable. They're in trouble. Anybody that's not correctable is in trouble because they'll continue to walk in their own ways and it'll bring more pride and think that they're right, you know, and they don't even want to listen to anything. They get to the place where they're unteachable. Now, that's a dangerous place to be in. Proverbs 5, 23. He shall die without, the word instruction means discipline, chastening, and correction. That's quite a statement. That means it's critical for us to be able to receive the discipline, chastening, and correction. We don't want to see this destruction coming upon us. Proverbs 8, verse 33. Hear instruction, be wise, refuse it not. We're told, this is a command to us. Proverbs 10, verse 17. He is in the way of life that keepeth or guards the discipline, chastening, correction, instruction that comes to him. But he that refuses the reproof, he errs. Uh, he's going astray. He's walking in sin. What's going to happen to him? Judgments are going to come because he's not walking in the way of the Lord and receiving what he should. That's why it's going to damage your soul if you don't are always be teachable, correctable, and receptive to the truth. And you've got to check everything out in line with the word. If you don't have chapter and verse to prove what you believe, you're in trouble. Proverbs 13, verse 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth discipline, chastening, and correction. Mm, that's not good. But he that regards the reproof, he'll be honored. God will honor you. Always be correctable, receptive to the things that God wants to bring forth to bring you in line. Proverbs 15.10, look what it says. Correction is grievous unto him that forsakes the way, but he that hates reproof, he shall die. He's in trouble. It is essential 
that we receive the correction of the Lord. Here we see it in Proverbs 19. And see, where is the correction going to affect you? It's in the soul, the way you think, the way you reason, the way you respond, the way you react to situations, see? Proverbs 19, 27. My son, cease, my son, to hear the discipline, chastening, correction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. This is someone bringing you instruction or telling you something that's causing you to err. Don't let anybody take you off of the Word of God and cause you to err and go in a wrong direction because they told you something that they believe. Make them prove it with chapter and verse. And if they can't, you know it's false. You cannot be listening to it. You should not allow any of that to get a hold of you. Over in the New Testament, it's important that we realize what it says about correction. He says, you've forgotten the exhortation that speaks unto you as unto a children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not, in order to bring us in line? If you be without chastisement, look what this says, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards, which means you're illegitimate. It's as if you aren't a son. Oh, that's critical trouble. And not sons. Oh, if you're not sons, you're going to be all kind of destruction. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? This is a, a matter of life and death. <laughs> it's pretty important that we put the Word of God first place. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pledge. We're talking about earthly fathers. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Will you ever come to holiness if you don't receive correction? No. Well, I believe it this way. We believe it this way. I'm going to do this. I got my own way. No. We all need to be correctable and ready to change. Have your repentance. I call them having your repentance shoes on at all times. Ready to change your mind, change your way, and start walking in the ways of the Lord and doing the things that are right in His sight. That is so important. This brings us to another point, is your soul can get really messed up by wrong doctrine. Look at all the different teachings out there, and people are all over the place with what they believe. It's astounding. Acts 15.24 tells us something. This is where they had these ones that were trying to tell them that they needed. We'll go back for a moment so you'll see the context of this. This is where there were certain of the sect of the Pharisees. They were believers, but they were still walking after the Old Testament law. And they said it was needful to circumcise them. I'm talking about physical circumcision. You don't need to do that in the New Testament. And command them to keep the law of Moses. That's the Old Testament law. No, that was wrong. Well, they had a tremendous uh, dealing with this. And comes, here's their conclusion down in verse 24. For as much as we've heard that certain went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. So you'll think wrong. So you'll choose wrong. So you'll believe wrong. Saying you must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we gave no such commandment. It was wrong. And these guys, he was de declaring the truth and correcting these ones that were, were speaking these wrong things. But notice what happened with the words. The words trouble you and will subvert your soul. This is why doctrine is very important. We have to check everything out in line with the Word of God. If someone is ever telling you things from extra biblical sources, throw it out. You don't believe it. Quoting all these things that are false. The book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, the book of, which doesn't even exist, the book of Jubilees, all these ones are lies. The book of Thomas, all these different things. They're not part of scripture whatsoever. You don't listen to any of that. That's all false. We look at the word of God. And you don't want to be deceived where somebody says some things and declares the prophecies or whatever, and then they don't come to pass. Well, you know, there's a problem for sure. Matthew 15, verse 9. 
In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There's many ministers today that teach doctrines that are commandments of men. How do you know? If they, you can't, they don't have chapter and verse to prove it, it's not of God. It's a commandment of man. It is not the truth whatsoever. You should not listen to it whatsoever. Even we're warned over here in Hebrews 13, verse 9. He says, Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. Well, they will carry you away. They'll deceive you. and They'll take you off in all kinds of directions. We've seen people go off in all kinds of directions that are totally off. Heresy. Believing crazy things that they have no chapter and verse for to prove whatsoever. No, we cannot be this going to affect your soul. It will subvert your soul, as we saw. First Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times which we're in. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. These are deceiving spirits. That means deceiving spirits are working in these people that are bringing false doctrines. And because they're not checking them out in line with the Word of God, they're being affected by the deceiving spirits. And doctrines of devils. The devil has doctrines. What are his doctrines? Anything that's contrary to the truth. It can even be a half-truth and half-lie. It's a doctrine of the devil because it's gotten you off track of the truth. Anything that does not in line with the Word of God that someone cannot prove with chapter and verse, do not receive it. Do not allow that to get a hold of you. Otherwise, it subverts your soul. We've got to be like the Bereans were. Acts 17, verse 11, talking about the Bereans, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all readiness of mind. We need to be receptive to the word. But they searched the scriptures daily whether the things were so. They just didn't receive anything that was said because so-and-so said it. I've had a lot of people say somebody has some, some kind of notoriety or people hear about them and think that that person should be telling you the truth. No, you've got to check everything out. I don't care who they are. I don't care how long they've been around or whatever, what, what, what their reputation is. It means nothing. You've got to check everything out in line with the Word of God. And look at how important doctrine is. This is quite a statement. 2 John, verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, this is the true doctrine, hath not God. That's quite a statement. The word hath is the word have, and it's present tense, meaning they're not having on an ongoing basis God because they have false doctrine. He that abideth, remaining in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. That means this is so important in you having relationship with the Father and with Jesus Christ. That means we cannot let our souls be subverted by false teaching. Always check things out in line with the Word of God and always make sure they're in line with the New Testament because we're in the New Testament and the way of the Spirit. You always must check things out. It is absolutely essential so you do not be deceived. Another thing is we have to make sure that we're not letting our soul be lifted up to worthless things. Worthless things would be anything that's not going to produce good things in you. Bring the Word to you. Bring revelation to you. Feed you the truth. Psalms 24, if we go back to verse 3, it says, Who's going to ascend in the hill of the Lord? Who's going to make it? Who's going to stand in His holy place? Who's going to go up? Not everybody. He that has clean hands, a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Vanity means anything that is empty, that is false, that is worthless, that's not the truth, that's lying. No. That means you don't want to hear anything that's not in line with the Word of God. 
This is why we don't watch any TV or listen to any movies. Why? Because are they teaching you truth? No, they're teaching you the way of the flesh. They're teaching you how to get angry. They're teaching you how to get upset. They're teaching you how to be depressed and down. They're teaching you how to be afraid and anxious about things. They're teaching you how to retaliate against people. They're teaching you how to be controlling and dominating and manipulating people. They'll teach you all kinds of things. They'll teach you to lust after people. <laughs> They'll teach you all kinds of evil. And if you, you say, well, I'm, it's just a program. I'm, I'm not doing that myself. But you have to understand, anything that you're allowing coming into you, it's coming into you. Amen. Just like you might have did it yourself. Well, the guy got angry. I'm, I'm not angry. But the anger came into you because you were watching this and that that's, it's coming into a transfer of spirits will come into you from what you open up your soul to. That's why we don't want to have anything lifted up to anything that is contrary to the Word of God. It will bring damage unto you. It'll damage your soul. Oh, I have people say, oh, well, but all these, I got these family-friendly programs, you know, that I like. They're not so bad. And I start telling, telling them all the things of what they do to you. <laughs> well, I guess it's not bringing the Word to me. That's for sure. It's bringing all kinds of false things. Look what the scripture tells us to do. Psalms 119, verse 37. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, anything that's empty, nothing, lying, worthless, anything that's not in line with the word. And quicken thou me in thy way. God always wants you to point you to the way of the word, not all these other things that are destructive in your life. You also got to make sure that you're always going to operate in faith, and you're going to keep your eyes on doing the things that God wants you to do and not let yourself be affected in your soul so you're not steadfast in the things of God. You got to guard your soul. Luke 21, 19, in your patience. This is a Greek word, hupomone, which means steadfastness and being constant. In your being constant and steadfast, and this is from the soulish realm, and your will, your intellect, your emotions, the way you're choosing, all these things. You possess your souls. And you being steadfast, you'll control the soulless realm so you won't yield to things that are wrong. And that is so important. In fact, look at over at James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. This isn't quite right. First of all, the word fall means to fall into as to be encompassed by. Otherwise, it doesn't say that you have automatically fallen into it. You're encompassed about it, so you might fall into it. The reason you say it, you might fall into it, because this is a subjunctive mood verb. You've got to look up the verbs. The subjunctive mood in the Greek means a conditional statement. It's, it has to have conditions met for it to be so. So the way you would translate it, as Young's brings out, that you may fall, or you might be falling because you've been in, 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 uh, encompassed by all these diverse temptations that are coming at you. The temptations are coming. What do you need to do? Make sure you don't let your joy go. Don't get down. Don't get upset. Don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Keep rejoicing. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Knowing this, it's the trine of your faith. You can keep rejoicing because you know God's going to bring you out, over, overcome all these attacks. You're not going to fall into this. If you do the word. The trine of your faith, it's going to work as to bring into operation steadfastness. If you're yielded to what's right. If you don't be steadfast on the word, you'll go down. And this thing will take you down and you'll have a fall. We're not going to give place to that. Let patience or steadfastness have its perfect work that you might be perfect and entire or complete, wanting or lacking nothing. Amen. You'll come through. Steadfastness in the soul on the word is critical. We see a lot of people, though, they throw in the towel. That's a mistake. In fact, look at what it even says over in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, 
which has great recompense of reward, your confidence in the Word, and your confidence in God performing the promises in your life. You have need of what? Steadfastness, hupomone, translated patience most of the time. You need to be steadfast in the soul. Don't cast away that confidence because you haven't seen something happen right now. I see that happen with all people all the time. They want it happening now, you know. <laughs> if it hadn't happened now, you just keep on until it comes to pass. You keep on praying, you keep on casting out, you keep on taking hold of the promise, you keep on speaking things into being, you hold fast to your confession, you do keep it going. You have need of steadfastness in the soul that after you've done the will of God, you might receive or carry off the promise. The promise will come to pass. The devil's trying to get you to not be steadfast in the soul. Or he wants to just get you to try to just throw in the towel and give up. You know, we can never do that. That means your soul has given place to the enemy. Look what it says in Hebrews 6.12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and not patience. This is not hupomone. It's a bad translation to King James. It is the word macrothumia, which means long-suffering. It's been translated long-suffering 12 times correctly, patience erroneously twice. This is one of the places. Through faith and long-suffering, inherit the promises. The word inherit, when we look at this, this is talking about showing you that it is a process to see the promises come to pass because it's a present tense verb. The way you would translate this, as Young's brings it out, are inheriting the promises. It is a work in progress that you're seeing come to pass. So, through your faith and long-suffering. Why do you need long-suffering? In the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet. But your faith's going to change them. Your faith's going to move the mountain. Your faith's going to receive the promise. Your faith, as you're working in deliverance, you're going to cast out all the demons and drive them out. There might be a whole lot there because you had a whole lot of sin in your youth or you got all this inherited generational stuff to drive out. You just be steadfast and you be long-suffering in the face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet. See, the devil will war against your soul and try to get you to give up or try another way. Well, try some other way. I bet people do that all the time, you know. They just want to, they want something done now. If it doesn't get done now, I'll go some other, what, some other direction. <laughs> that shows they have no confidence in the Word of God or in what God will perform. They don't understand. You have to drive all the enemies out and put them, see them be eliminated before you're going to see the victory. And a lot of times it's going to be quite a lengthy a battle until you see the victory come forth in your life. This brings us to another point that works against your soul. And that is those who are slothful, they're lazy, they don't do what needs to be done. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard, he desires things. Oh, everybody has, soul wants something. And he has nothing because he's lazy. He's a sluggard. He doesn't get things done. But the soul of the diligent, ah, this is the one who gets things done. And he's going to do whatever it takes. His soul will be made fat, as opposed to one who has a lean soul that's not right before God. You see, verse 19 goes on and says, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul because you saw it through. You saw it come to pass. Have you got 25 projects going and none of them completed? <laughs> uh, it's not sweet to the soul, is it? Because you haven't got it accomplished yet. We need to be diligent and see things through. The devil tries to get you off track. Be lazy, be slothful. Not do what needs to be done. No, we can't allow that to happen whatsoever. It's going to affect you in your life. You must conquer this. Proverbs 15, verse 19. The way of a slothful man is a hedge of thorns. That means if he's a lazy guy, it's like there's just blocks everywhere he goes. A hedge of thorns. 
I thought everything's supposed to be good, and all these things are hindering me. But the way of the righteous is made plain, because the righteous are diligent. The righteous will fight. The righteous will speak the word. The righteous will put their faith in operation, and they will go through whatever needs to be done to conquer all the enemies. Proverbs 10, verse 26. As vinegar to the teeth, ugh, that's irritating, isn't it? Smoke to the eyes, that's irritating. So is the sluggard to them that send him. Someone sends you to do something and they're a lazy sluggard and don't get it done. That's irritating. <laughs> they're not someone I'm going to count on. You know, if someone doesn't show themselves to be faithful, you can't count on that person, that's for sure. It's irritating. Well, we'd be irritating to the Lord if we don't do the things that He wants. We're lazy and slothful. Well, the body tries to convince you. I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> don't listen to it. Don't be deceived by that body. Proverbs 24, 30. It went by the field of the slothful, by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Oh, it was grown, all grown over with thorns and nettles that covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Everything goes down if you're lazy and slothful, and you're not doing what you need to be doing, because you haven't got your soul in order. Then I saw and considered it well, looked upon it, and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Don't be one of these that love sleep. Talks of warns against love and sleep. You need sleep, but not be love and sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man comes, in, comes like suddenly, like an armed man coming upon you. Destruction. Well, what shall we be like? Proverbs chapter 6 tells us about the ant. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Have you ever seen an ant just sitting doing nothing? They're always busy, aren't they? They're always on the go. And they're doing, they have no guide, overseer, or ruler, but they seem to sure know what they're doing because they're following what they're supposed to be doing. You should be following the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in the Word of God. Yet the ant doesn't even have one, and he provides her, meat in the, uh, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest, gets everything done. We should be getting everything done. How long wilt thou sleep, thou sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Little sleep, little slumber, little folding the hands to sleep. Same thing. The poverty comes as one that travels, and I want as an armed man. And you wonder why things aren't working out in your life. We cannot allow that. We've got to make sure we're doing the right things at all times in our life. Be diligent. Diligence is the opposite. The diligent, they're the ones that rule. The diligent, they're the ones that get the victory. The ones that are diligent are the ones that see through to the deliverance, and they're, they're consistent. You know, they, they won't draw back whatsoever. They're going to keep on fighting until the fight is won. In fact, you need to be a diligent doer of the Word of God in all areas. You also need to be keeping your word. Many people say they're going to do something and then they don't do it. That's no good. Numbers 30, the verse 2, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord and swear an oath to bind his soul, he bound his soul with a bond. Why well, change mind? I don't want to do it now. Well, if you said you're going to do it, you better do it. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Think about what you say you're going to do before you say it. You can't be committing to do something and then breaking your word. No, we need to be doing the things that God wants for us to do. And you know, you've come into covenant relationship with God, and you know, your soul is bound with a bond because you are now in covenant. When you come into covenant, you have vowed a vow. <laughs> you came into covenant. I want those promises, including eternal life. Well, they're not going to happen if you don't meet the conditions, because you've got your part to play. See, we are in a covenant relationship, and God expects us 
to do what he says. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not sl be slack to pay it. That's if you say you're going to pay such and such. The Lord God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee if you don't do it. Verse 23, That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which is promised with thy mouth. Let me make a comment on this. Watch that ministries don't try to get you to vow something to give to their ministry. Now you're in bondage. You've got to perform it. They do that out there because they're trying to get you yoked so that you'll have so the money. See, I tell a person, don't ever do that. You obey God, and it says you give offerings as you purpose in your heart. Don't let them lock you in on a vow. Well, you need to vow $100 a month or something like that to our ministry, you know? That's bondage. I say, I never vow anything. I will give as the Holy Spirit leads and guides me to give and as he prompts me whenever he does. That's what I tell them. It shuts them up and they go try to find someone else they can fall, get into their old, their bondage of vowing. Don't let that happen. If you do vow, you got to perform it. You're responsible, remember, so be wise and don't make unwise vows in your life. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Another thing that we must do, we must eliminate things coming out of our mouth that are not of the Lord. Ephesians 5, verse 4 says, filthiness, that's obscenity. No obscenity should be coming out of the mouth of a Christian. Never. Foolish talking, just rambling, talking about stupid stuff. <laughs> no. Hey, your words are important. Why would we go around talking about all this silly stuff? Nor jesting. Oh, that's the guy, it's the jokey guy. The sarcasm guy. The kidding guy. You know, the life of the party, always making funny and jokes and all this kind of thing. The Bible says these are not convenient or they're not fitting for a Christian. We don't want to do that. Did you ever see Jesus doing that? Did Jesus have any filthiness, foolish talking, or jesting and making jokes and all these things? Never. It's all of the world. It's of the devil. And sarcasm isn't destructive or kidding. You say some, well, I didn't mean that. But you might have hurt them. Your words have power, are carriers, and you can hurt someone and wound them. Well, it's only kidding, you know. You say something derogatory against them. Oh, it's only kidding. Just think of how many people have been hurt and wounded, especially as children, by people saying all these kind of things. No. This needs to be eliminated. God wants us to get rid of all of this. Another thing that's important that will damage you is lying. We can't lie. That means we always must tell the truth. We can't have just kind of shade the truth. No. Psalms 120 verse 2, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. You don't want to hear lying lips or deceitful tongue, and you don't want to let it come out of your mouth at the same time. Make sure you're speaking truth. And you're not just, you know, lying to cover up something. That's a mistake. And you don't want to hear anything that's not the truth either. You know, those people who say, well, just eat the meat, spit out the bones. I heard that forever. I'm sorry. I don't want to hear anything that's bones. <laughs> I only want to hear something that's edible, that's going to feed me the truth of the Word of God. If something's not come in line with the truth, sorry. I don't want to have anything to do with it whatsoever. We want to get rid of all that. But lying has to be eliminated. We can't have it. Psalms 101, verse 7. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. <laughs> He's going to be finished. He's in trouble. Psalms 119. Even Little lies or evading the truth, you know. No, we can't be doing that. Psalms 119, 163. I hate and abhor lying. 
always tell the truth. Don't speak lies. If you've spoke lies, confess that as sin, repent, turn from it. Don't let it happen again in your life. Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. That's what God thinks. We don't want to be an abomination to the Lord whatsoever. Chapter 13, verse 5. A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man's loathsome and cometh to shame. Well, the politicians need to read these verses, don't they? Amen. Most all of them are liars. They tell, speak lies. They're all in trouble. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He's going to be punished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Oops. Verse 9. A false witness, the same thing, he says, speaketh lies shall not perish. He's, he's going to, shall perish. So he's going to not escape. He's going to be, go, he's going to be punished and he's going to perish. He is in trouble. In fact, we see over in Revelation what happens to the guys that are liars. If you've lied in the past, don't do it again. <clears throat> Revelation 21.8, The fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, and dollars, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's no justification for lying. Revelation 22, verse 15. You've got to make sure your word is right. This is talking about the guys that don't get into the city. The guys that get into the city are the guys that are doing his commandments continually. But without, that don't get the city, are the dogs, the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the fornicators and all those, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The liars are in the lake of fire. The liars will be destroyed. They will get nowhere. We cannot allow these kind of things. Another thing goes along with this, because we see the whoremongers, is we cannot allow lust to get a hold of us. You must guard yourself. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. This will destroy your soul as well. Whoso committeth adultery, the woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth destroyeth his own soul. He just didn't destroy a relationship, or, you know, or whatever, or maybe have a physical effect from it, from the sexual sin. You destroy your soul. A wound, dishonor shall he get, and reproach shall not be wiped away. We can't be ever allowing ourselves to get into any, because adultery is breaking covenant. See, we can't be doing that. We can't be involved in any kind of adultery or any kind of this evil stuff whatsoever. In fact, you gotta watch out that you keep that flesh underfoot. First Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts the war against your soul. They're working at you, trying to take you down. Don't allow that to happen. We cannot allow any of these kind of things to happen. It's damaging your soul, it's destroying your soul. It, these things are warring against your soul and will take you down. God also wants to make sure that we're speaking right words and we also are dealing with words that come from others. Don't let words that come from others damage you. Job chapter 19, verse 2. How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? It's affecting your soul. It's damaging you. You don't want to be around somebody that's speaking a bunch of negative things at you. It's vexing your soul. You know, again, that the nursery rhyme that says, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> you can be broken pieces with words. 
and it will do a job on your uh, vexing your soul. Destruction. Look what happened. Why did Samson finally yield? Ah, because it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words instead of getting rid of her <laughs> and urged him so his soul was vexed unto death. Then he finally told her all his heart. Don't let, and the same way the devil can try to get after you with words or thoughts coming from him day after day after day after day. You can't let that go on. It'll wear you down in your soul. You've got to resist that, cast that down, come against that, attack that. Declare no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I condemn every tongue that rises against me. I speak the word against that and extinguish those fiery darts. When the attacks came against Jesus, he just didn't sit there and ignore it. A lot of people say, well, I'm just kind of ignoring it. Oh, no, it's working you over. Jesus said, it's written, it's written, it's written. He dealt with it, with the word of God, with the power of God against the enemies coming at you. That is what we must do. Now, so we talked about a lot of things important tonight that we need to deal with in the area of our soul. What must we do? Let's look at these few scriptures before we stop for tonight. Psalms 142. All these things, if you have any areas of sin or these things have occurred, they have caused you to be in captivity in your soul. Psalms 142, verse 7. Bring my soul out of prison. We're in prison, spiritually, in the soulless realm. If you have any of these things going on in your life, that's why you're going, how are you going to come out? You're going to cast the demons out. Of course, you're going to Confess the sin, turn away from them. You've got to correct all the problems in your life. Remember, when you're casting out demons, if you don't correct the problems, you'll be right back in the worst shape. Many people just want to cast out demons, but don't correct the problems. That's a mistake. 50, Psalms 55, 18. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. It will be a battle. The devil's not going to go easily. You have to make him go by the authority and power of God, and he will. There were many with me. Wow, that's how I came victorious in the battle. Who's with me? The angels. The angels that are performing the word. The angels, remember, they excel in their mighty and power and strength, and they do his commandments hearkening to the voice of the word. They will work on your behalf. Psalms 124, verse 7 and 8. My, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. Your soul is to get escaped. Be like an escape when you get these evil spirits out of you. It's like they're gone. I'm free. The snare is broken and we're escaped. How's that going to happen? Because you're going to use the name of the Lord. Our help's in the name of the Lord. You're going to use the name of Jesus and cast those devils out. Amen. Or resist any tax if they're coming from the outside so they will flee from you. You must guard your soul as well. You can't just let things just come into you from any way. Proverbs 22, 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward, but he doth, that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. The word keep is shamar, which means to guard. You're to guard your soul. Don't let things come into you. Don't let things get into you. If they come, then you've got to deal with them. You can't just ignore them. I've, I've had lots of people say, well, I just ignore, the, you know, ignore those feelings and those thoughts and those attitudes and all this stuff that come at me from the devil, whether it's from the outside or whether it's from the demons within or whatever. That's a mistake. You need to deal with them. Confront them. Conquer them. Guard your soul. It's imperative. And you've got to be taught the Word of God so you don't give place to anything and again, ever again. Psalms 25, 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease because he's walking in the way that the Lord has set for him. You've got to be a doer of the Word. That was what must happen for you in your life. And remember... We even see it over in Matthew, chapter 11. Matthew. 
you got to learn the word and then put it in operation. Because look what it says. Take my yoke upon me, you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. Because you do the word. The word in you will produce rest in your soul. And that's what we want. The battleground with the enemy is in the soul. If you don't get your will choosing right, or your mind thinking right, or your reasoning properly, or your emotions under control, and you don't keep things from the body, its, it's desires under control, in line with the Spirit, the Word of God, you're going to be having all kinds of problems. And again, we'll conclude with these last two scriptures that we did before. As your soul goes, so goes your overall prosperity and health. You've got to win the battle in the soul. That's where the battle is. And that means your mind's got to get renewed to the truth. Proverbs 23, verse 7. As he thinketh in his soul, so is he. Now that means what's in your soul is important. It's going to affect the way you think. It's going to affect the way you choose. It's going to affect your, even your attitudes. It'll affect the way you react. See, so many people, they sin left and right by reacting to situations. We can't be reactors. We've got to be speaking what God wants in every situation, always functioning in the Spirit. Jesus didn't get beat up by the devil with all the attacks that came against him. He just responded in the Spirit to every situation. That's what we need to do. Don't be a reactor out of the flesh, out of my feelings, out of me, 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 I, I, I. You learn to do this, your days of being hurt are over. We don't have to get hurt. We don't have to get down. We don't have to get what they said about me. It's all a bunch of me, me, me. They hurt me. They rejected me. They didn't listen to me. On and on. That's all flesh stuff reacting. You don't want to let that happen in your life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you. As I see the problems in the soulless realm, I will correct them all. I will make sure that I'm guarding my soul. My soul is coming out of prison because I'm casting out all the devils. And I will not give place to anything in the area of the soul that's contrary to the Word of God. As I'm walking in line with the Word and I keep the Word in me, thinking on what the Word says, choosing the way of the Word, not letting the flesh or the emotions dictate what I do or cause me to react. I will always operate in the Spirit, thinking what the Word says. I will not let the enemy get to my soul. I will make sure I'm not listening to false doctrine that will subvert my soul. I'm going to check everything out in line with the Word of God. I won't let my soul faint. Instead, I'll keep moving forward with the authority and power of God and my faith in operation to conquer all enemies, to see the promise come to pass. I will be steadfast. I will be long-suffering. I will never faint. I will always pray. I will see God bring forth His promise he is faithful to perform it, and he watches over it. So the battleground in the area of the soul, it must be won, and it will be won in my life, because my soul is submitted to the Spirit, and it will always operate according to the Word of God from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You carry that out? You're on your way to victory. Your days of being hurt, down, depressed, upset, reacting wrong, making a mess of situations, saying things you shouldn't be saying, you know. All these things are over. See, we're going on to perfection. Hallelujah. So our spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until at the coming of the Lord. Praise God. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth. We will be doers of the word. We'll eliminate these problems, correct everything, come in line with your word. Thank you for our souls being established
in the Word of God. And a fat soul, not a lean soul, not an unstable soul, but a soul that's established, always doing what the Word says in every situation. Thank you for bringing all of our souls out of prison as we cast all the devils out. Thank you that we will guard our soul and make sure that we're always doing what the Word says, thinking correctly in our soul. So we'll see the promises come to pass. And we understand as our soul goes, our prosperity and health will occur. So we're going to prosper and be in health because our soul is going to get in line. Thank you for bringing all your promises to pass and performing this Word in our lives because we're hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen.